From the field to the pharmacy. Well, I'm Ben Plumley. I'm the host of a Shot in the Arm podcast, and I'm proud to serve as a member of the board of directors of the EcoHealth Alliance. I've spent my life focused on strategies to increase global health capacity and close gaps in access that often separate the privileged from the less so. So I'm really excited to facilitate this discussion about translating EcoHealth Alliance science into solutions that keep us all safe. And to do that, I'd like to introduce you to some very special guests. Well, over in the field corner, you've already met him. Dr. Peter Dashak is the president of EcoHealth Alliance. He has decades of experience studying the impact of disease, both on animals and, pe and people. And he's an expert in understanding the drivers that spread disease. Peter, welcome to this discussion. Great to be here, Ben. And we also have Dr. Tillman Gerngross, the co-founder and CEO of Adagio Therapeutics. Now, Adagio is developing antibody treatments to prevent coronavirus infection, and not just the one, SARS-CoV-2, that causes COVID-19, but the many hundreds and thousands of other coronaviruses in the world. So welcome, Tillman. Thanks for having me, Ben. Excited to be here. And finally, over in the investment corner, we have Clive Meanwell. Well, fans of rugby, I guess France and Scotland and Wales particularly, may recognise him. But these days, he's the executive chairman and founder of Population Health Partners, which invests in innovative therapeutic and approaches to alleviate the global burden of disease, including, including short and longer term threats. Clive, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. It's great to be here, Ben. So I'd like to start things at the, uh, at the 38,000 foot level, if you don't mind. And I'm interested to get all of your thoughts on how we can mitigate the threats of pandemics. Is it a matter of adapting to the changes that we have in front of us? Or are there things that we can do um, to take us back to a, a, a cleaner, better place? Peter, let me start with you. You are the perennial optimist. What's the future for the One Health field? Yeah, and I'm very optimistic about this. I mean, I think that what's happened with COVID-19 is it's woken us up to the threat that we all knew was out there and we've been talking about for the past 20 plus years, that pandemics are increasing in frequency. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to see more of them. They're going to move quicker. And they're going to be more threatening to our lives and our livelihoods because we're connected now like never before. Um, but the positive side of this is we're smart and we can think and adapt and change and stop relying on our old fashioned approaches. Now, what we've seen with COVID-19 is, uh, you know, it really takes us back to um, what happened in the great influenza pandemic a century ago. We've got to um, hunker down. Um, and do the basic public health measures to avoid getting infected. But meanwhile, our scientists are in the labs designing these new, cool approaches to treating the illness from them and to preventing them emerging in the first place. And that's what we've got to do. If we stay smart and adapt, we will beat the era of pandemics. Let me just push you a bit, Peter, on the era of pandemics question. So often we're being told, oh, this is once in a lifetime, once in a century's uh, epidemic. But that's not what we're saying, are we? Because of the clash between climate and, um, <clears throat> pardon me, climate and, um, and human growth, we are entering a new age of pandemics. Uh, can we really be that optimistic if we are about to see a whole new range of pathogens coming towards us? Well, you know, we've got to look at this. Um, we've got to go back to the basics. Know your enemy. Um, absolutely, we're in an era of pandemics, and this has been increasing over the last few decades. We've got unprecedented levels of population growth, road building into remote areas, wildlife trade, deforestation. They're the things that drive pandemics. They're what bring people and animals into contact and allow the viruses to emerge in the first place. We're connected like never before. Viruses will exploit those pathways to spread. But the good news is we know all this and we know how to prevent that. 
we can work smarter in the way we um, develop on the ground. More sustainable development will reduce the risk. We can be smarter in the alarm systems we set up to find the first cases so we act quicker. And we can be smarter in the therapeutics, vaccines, and approaches to preventing and treating these diseases when they emerge. And that's what we're dealing with today. Tillman, so really the same question for you. Uh, I mean, Adagio is at the forefront of a new wave of medicines that could be used for all societies. But um, do we have the window to be able to get these innovations developed and approved, but then also created in formulations that they, that they can literally be be distributed around the world like a like a can of Coke? I mean, the short answer is yes. And it all starts with what Peter said. I mean, Peter and his organization and his collaborators all over the world have shown us where to look. They've shown us where these large animal reservoirs are in contact with humans how the spillover occurs. We don't know which farm at which wet market, but we know generally that this family of viruses has been exploiting receptors in human airway cells and has been finding many ways of getting in there. There are millions of infections in Southern China, as again documented by Peter and his collaborators, where viruses from bats spill over into humans. And every once in a while, what happens is they acquire a mutation that makes them more fit that makes them better at entering human cells, that makes them better at being stable in, in the air, whatever it may be. And before you know it, a local event becomes a global event. All the trends that Peter had already pointed to. So again, that's the bad news. The good news is that we're increasingly good at understanding of what the human immune response to those infections is. So we understand at the molecular level, which molecules the body makes to protect the body from these viral um, pathogens. And it is this technology that I think has advanced over the past five to 10 years to an extent where we can do that very quickly. So when this pandemic emerged, within months, people were um, isolating antibodies from convalescent patients and quickly moving them into clinical development, where within a year, we had the first treatments that without question saved lives. So that's all the good news. Um, I think what we are doing differently at Adagio is that we have a more long-term view, very similar to, I think, how Peter sees this world, which is we already kind of know where they are coming from. When you look at the sequence of SARS-CoV-2, any virologist looks at the sequence and can look at the sequence and say, I know which human receptor this virus exploits. I know how this receptor gets into humans without ever having seen an, a patient, without ever having seen the virus. So that body of knowledge takes investment, takes time, and the commitment from people like Peter that are willing to do that. And it is that body of work that is now the foundation of drug developers like myself who can take that information and start thinking about how do we come up with treatments, not just against this particular outbreak, which as we're finding is a game of whack-a-mole. It's first the Wuhan virus, now it's the UK variant. Oh, now it's the South African variant. Oh, now it's the Brazilian variant. And before we know it, many of these drugs that were developed early on are now becoming ineffective. Mm -hmm. And so this long-term view and understanding the threat and dealing with it in a systematic fashion, without question, that's gonna put us in a much, much better situation the next time around. Thank you. Clive, uh, your second career, um, you know, the obvious question is, why on earth did you choose population health as an ex as an existential threat to humanity? But but maybe I could put it a slightly different way. Um, maybe even five years ago in the field of immunology, it would be fair to say that we were in the Middle Ages. Do you think with the rapid advancements in science that we've seen over these last few years, that we are entering a new renaissance age of medical and clinical research? Well, as a matter of fact, I do, but I'm a little bit concerned about how we make that uh, transition. What we've been doing in the last 25, 30 years, you could even take it back 50 or 60 years if you want to go back to the, to the first um, understanding of, of DNA, for example, um, is we've been unpacking simple biology. We've been unpacking simple pathways. Um, you, you mentioned inflammation. Obviously, 
you know, IL-1 became an extraordinary journey for us. And now I'm the number one selling drug in the world is Humira. And it is a tremendous drug. However, there's a problem which uh, I've discussed with Tillman and Peter on more, more than one occasion. And that is that our, our investments in healthcare have gone boutique. If you imagine Volkswagen, the Volkswagen Group dropping all cars except their Lamborghinis and only making Lamborghinis and making very few of them and making them very expensively, that's where the biopharmaceutical industry is right now. We've become a boutique industry, a very, very good one. I'm trained as an oncologist and did research in, in, in cancer treatment. I appreciate the progress we've made in cancer, rare diseases, immunology. But it's just the beginning because that's uh, a very tiny proportion of the world population. And the vast majority of people, thank goodness, will not get immunological diseases, will not get cancer, will not get... Uh, rare diseases by definition, but they will get heart disease and they will get viruses and they will get bacteria and they will get all kinds of things during pregnancy which, which threaten mothers and, uh, and children. And I think there we've lost our way a bit. Now my hope, my optimism to join with Tillman and Peter is that as we unpack the biology at the simple end, we'll gradually be able to move our biological understandings into more complex problems. Now, the complexity is not really the biology, as, as fancy as the stuff that Tillman does. He would admit this himself. His scientific team brilliantly dissected this problem and went about it very, very logically um, and methodically. The real challenge I see, Ben, is global leadership. I want to end this introductory comment by just reminding us that Napoleon, Napoleon um, had his entire army um, inoculated against smallpox in the early 1800s. Now, at the time, he was in the, the, the inflagration of all uh, against everyone in Europe, especially us British. And yet, he turned to Edward Jenner, the English scientist, and adopted his methodologies. And after inoculating his entire army, he gave Edward Jenner a Medal of Freedom of France. And I think this is the sort of thing we need. We, we, we've got to have leader. I, I'm not necessarily a fan of uh, Napoleon having a been beaten up by the French myself a couple of times. But I think um, we have to have people who can transcend the nationalism, the, the jingoism, the stupidity, and actually take the expert advice of people like Peter and Tillman and actually act on it. And, and if, I'm any, if I have any reason to be in population health, it's to, it's to join those dots. Can I just add something, Clive, because I think it's, it's, it's very interesting and completely consistent with my observations. The issue, though, is, in my opinion, this. Drug development is so expensive. It is so expensive to run clinical trials because you're building a bridge where 95% of all bridges never get completed. Yet you still have to pour the foundation and do all the work and, because the failure rate is so, so high. So that is something we can afford in the first world. And at this point, it's just very, very difficult to then rapidly move into sort of more emerging parts of the world. You remember the days when having a car phone was like a status symbol. You would drive around and, you know, you could take a phone call in your car. Um, that has now been democratized. Every goat in Africa has a cell phone, right? So I think it starts, in, the innovation starts in wealthier countries, but then ultimately gets disseminated over the world. And I think what you're saying, Clive, is we need to find ways of disseminating it more quickly. I agree. Generating the evidence and then disseminating it. I mean, the evidence generation machinery for clinical data has been proven to be woefully inadequate on a global basis. Uh, Janet Woodcock at the FDA has a data lake which shows that over 90% of all the trials started in COVID are really not designed adequately to get an answer. They're not big enough. They're not randomized. They're not blinded. They're not reliable ways of creating valid information that policymakers and purchasers can move on. So uh, we have to address that problem now. It can be done. We've seen it with things like the recovery trial. One or two, but not all of the NIH trials I would describe as adequate. Um, you need big numbers, you need to randomize, and you need to do it on the backbone of technology that makes it easy to do. Um, I've spent 30 years trying to perfect that problem, still nowhere close. But bringing clin large clinical trial costs down by 10 to 30 fold 
requires a complete rethink, but thankfully technology is going to allow us to get there and we're well on our way in my view. So I'd like to use the road building analogy just for a little longer and, 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 and Peter come to you about this. It's all very well building roads, uh, but we've got to think about the cars that drive on them and it's uh, it's not acceptable for us to be thinking of, you know, high-end, <clears throat> no offence to the Germans, but BMWs, Audis and Mercedes that work in the industrialised world. We need to have, you know, good old VW Beetles easily serviced that can pretty much go anywhere, do the job, but go anywhere. And I think that's what we have to be thinking about in terms of drug and particularly formulation development, which has been a challenge for both uh, the mRNA and some of the uh, monoclonal antibody treatments that we found in um, found so early on for the treatment of COVID or vaccination of COVID. And so, Peter, for you, I mean, you, you, your scientists are collecting samples from caves, from uh, from wildlife each year, and and so what is in those samples and, and how can you take the information you get from those samples, those pathogens, and how do you, you give them to Tillman and Clive to, to, be, to, to be used so that we are better prepared for the next time a virus causes an outbreak? Yeah, it's actually, I've got to say, when I first started talking with Clive and Tillman, it was interesting. Clive sent me some papers from his uh, one of the products they've been working on. I, I couldn't believe it. I looked at the scientific paper, and in the methods, there's there are the bat viruses we worked on. Wow, you know that that being used to design the coolest next generation of how we're going to defeat these pandemics. And you know, there's something extremely rewarding about that. As a scientist, you're really driven by excitement of new findings. I think for me personally, for many of us, what drives us is something new that no one thought of or no one's seen before. Um, and, and you kind of, you follow a line of thought and wow, it was right, I was correct, there it is. And there's something exciting about that discovery. But then most scientists, you know, they publish it in a journal and it maybe gets into the press a couple of times in your career. And that's it. But what we've got here and what we push and push and push at Ego Health Alliance is science that has value and use for society and then to see that used is not easy you know to go to policymakers and say here's what we found please do something we've got these wildlife markets that are causing outbreaks please close them down you know and you can bang and bang on the door and eventually it might happen but what we've got with the work that clive and tillman are doing is using our science without without us even connecting at first and turning it into the next generation, the future solution. Now, what do we do to, to get there? And what our scientists do on the ground around the world is we go to the emerging disease hotspots. We found out that using some predictive mathematical modeling where these diseases are likely to emerge. We go to those places. They tend to be rural, um, difficult to access in often low middle income countries, um, rural China, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, um, Liberia, uh, Bolivia, Peru, the, the forests, the jungles of the world where the wildlife are, where someone's building a road into a forest, bushmeat hunters go in and get the first infections. What we do is we go to the end of the road, we go to the edge of the forest, we work with the wildlife that are there, we work with the communities that are there, we go to the most high risk people, the people who are hunting and eating wildlife, the people who live near, um, near bat caves. And we test them and we look for evidence of these viruses infecting people. We go to the clinics, we find out what new diseases are popping up. We try and catch them before they become pandemics. And we. Well, yeah, sorry, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, tell well, me. I just wanted to, this is so fascinating because, but I wanted to make an attempt to tie all this together because you were out there in about seven years ago, you, uh, you um, co published this paper on this virus with one. Yeah. which is another beta coronavirus that is, in, is present in bats um, and was isolated and shown um, in a publication in 2017 by, in a collaboration with you and Ralph Barrick, that this virus isolated from bats is able to transmit into human airway epithelial cells. Yeah. That's bad yeah. news. And in yeah. that paper, 
And that's so that's so fascinating. That paper from 2017, it says that the ability of this virus to exploit human airway tissue to get into human cells is a real warning for the potential of a future coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, we didn't do it, and, and is an opportunity to do something about it. Of course, we didn't do anything about it. Now, let me tie that back to again to the work that had to happen to get us to this point. So Peter's out there identifying these viruses. When we got into the game on trying to find something for SARS-CoV-2, we said we need something that goes beyond the current outbreak because A, there will be variants. This is known that these viruses change over time. But more importantly, there will be other outbreaks from the same family. And so let's find a way of getting all the isolates that have been identified, many by Peter and his collaborators, and let's make sure that the treatment we come up with neutralizes every single one of them. Because when you do that, then the probability of you being able to treat the next one that emerges is very, very, very high. So you're sort of able to predict the future to some extent. And had we not had information that was generated by Peter and his collaborators, we could not have done that. So there's the foundation. Then you need drug developers like myself who then turn that information into molecules. And then you need people like Clive who then says, okay, if you think it does this, let's design the proper clinical trial where we show that this molecule actually protects, actually treats, and let's find a way of financing that activity. So that is how the three people on this panel sort of work together um, without any sort of specific agreements. It's just Peter did his work. We picked up the ball. Clive came in. And so I think that's how all of a sudden Peter reads this paper and he sees how his work is touching people's lives. We can say without question that this work now has touched people's lives and saved people from coming down with a severe respiratory and illness. And Tillman, there's one That's additional area, there's one additional area to add to that, and I'm not for a minute suggesting that I represent it, but once we've got the technology, once we've got the treatments, we need to be communicating to patients in a much more sophisticated and open way about why these work. Um, we're talking at, at the moment about vaccine hesitancy, and it's, <clears throat> it's not the usual um, uh, mumps and rubella vaccine, the 3M uh, vaccine, MMR vaccine that uh, kids in uh, Marin County, north of San Francisco, uh, were refused by their par parents to have. There is some really serious issues now about trust in science. So as well as the very basic researchers, the translators, the people taking drugs to market, the conversation with communities about the value of these uh, of these investments, we really need to put much more into it. That I think is one of the key optimistic lessons for me of this era. Well, Ben, uh, I want to just uh, link to Tillman and you. The, the 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 problem you've described is is, and the opportunity is very real, but the the missing face on this screen is a policymaker. And uh, look, I've never met a good scientist who, who exhibits hubris. I, 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 it's just not done. It's not part of the process. Science begins, as, as, uh, as, as has been said by others, science begins with the criticism of myths. So, so, so by definition, science is a humble beginning because you say, hey, that doesn't sound right. And I can tell you both Peter and Tillman, uh, and I'll exclude myself because I'm not at their level of scientific competence, that they demonstrate that all the time, as do their teams. Like, what, what's wrong with this picture? Why, how, what can we learn from this? What, how do we refute something, not how do we prove how great we are? And that's why I mentioned the Napoleon thing. If we don't have leadership around the world uh, that actually has the balls to pick this up and run with it, we're, we're really screwed. The problem we've got right now is there is no policy leadership on a worldwide basis. Um, there is very little um, real understanding of the global threat other than, you know, Wolf Blitzer. And, and none of us really want to get it from our news channel like that. We want to get it from our leaders, but none of our leaders actually understand it. None of them have taken the time to understand it. They, they, they have the people around them. It needs a, a, an integrated view on a global basis. There's a lot of jingoism and nationalism going on, which is very weird to me under this circumstance. Again, the exact opposite of, of, of Napoleon Bonaparte at the time. There's actually a po poor transparency of data on a worldwide basis. Uh, Tony Blair today put out 
a big missive about uh, could all the big companies post their vaccine data so that everyone can take a look at it. I don't know how many girls have had uh, uh, brain uh, <clears throat> venous thromboembolism uh, in the last uh, uh, year, um, but I do know there's a background rate, and I doubt whether there's zero in the Pfizer and in the uh, 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 Moderna vaccine database. I doubt whether it's zero. COVID patients. I mean, there are, I'm sure yeah. there's some in COVID patients, right? So absolutely. So we need to get to the bottom of that because. We're scaring everybody to death at the moment because of our bungling of the, of, as you say, Ben, of the communication. So mums are saying, I'm not letting my daughter have the vaccine, even if she qualifies because, which is totally understandable. If, if we don't get this under control, this communication channel, and I don't mean in a manipulative way, I mean in yeah. a transparent way, like, like Tony is saying, then the, the work of Peter and Tillman, while it will it will solve the problem eventually, it'll solve the problem you know one two three years later than we could otherwise solve it. Fine. Uh, you, you've said a couple of times about um, the need for breaking down the national boundaries on these issues, and I, I want to pick up on that because this is exactly the problem I see. Viruses don't think. Number one, if they did think, they wouldn't be worried who they were infecting and check the passport first, or you know, um, decide whether you're rich or poor or what gender you are or what ethnicity you are they just infect us and move on that's what they do um, and we make a mistake by designing our own national programs to defeat them we need to act like a virus to defeat a virus think like a virus we need to think globally on these issues because they're spreading through the pathways that we set up and there is a distinct lack of political leadership on this global scale to defeat these. I totally agree with It is interesting, problem. isn't it, that the um, that the the wave of nationalism and populism came just before COVID nineteen. Yeah. And it's so clearly uh, COVID nineteen has so clearly outpaced that kind of nationalism, whether you saw it as being vaccine nationalism whether you saw it as, you know, cutting your country off from the rest of the world. As you say, the virus doesn't care. Um, it's going to require a fundamental change in the way we, we behave and think about, um, about well, well, this. Let's just think about it right now. We've got these variants popping up around the world. Meanwhile, in the US, we've got, we've got really what looks like a great momentum on vaccine coverage. Let, let's ignore the hesitancy for a minute and assume we get to herd immunity in the US. We're going to feel safe. Meanwhile, in the countries that can't afford the vaccine, that we haven't bothered to set up networks to supply vaccines or therapeutics, um, we're going to see raging infections that will push the virus to mutate, to, to divert and, and defeat the very vaccines and drugs we're relying on. And that's why these broad acting therapeutics that Tillman's been designing with Clive are so critical. But also what we need is we need to focus on things like COVAX, focus on issues of those countries like India right now, where the virus is raging and causing horrible, horrible uh, mortality rates. And think about it, even from a selfish point of view, that's going to drive mutations that are going to completely defeat um, our current strategy. So it's, it's short-sightedness that is, in this case, very, very bad for our health. Well, I, it's, it's just fascinating to listen to Peter because the number of conversations we have had with major pharma companies in India, in South America, in a desire to get into their hands the best, most broadly neutralizing anybody, I can't tell you how many hours I spent on the phone. They say, not enough of a market here. This was, a, this was um, half a year ago. Not enough of a market here. Only few people can afford it. We're not interested. And yet, Tillman, and yet, Tillman, you and your team went running into South Africa went to, 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 to try to recruit more patients with the variant, running into Brazil to try to things that big pharma companies would typically not do, frankly. And you reached out, you offered incredible, uh, frankly, financial terms to these low and middle income countries. We have pharma companies refusing to talk to low and middle income countries, which I think is 
it's absolutely uh, astonishing at a moment like this. I know. This. I mean, we spent 20, 30 years like fighting that. HIV, developing these these sense of global know, partnerships. What the hell happened? I, I'll tell you something. Well, what the, hell, what, the hell, what the hell happened is that people decided the only way to make money in pharma is, is, is by selling Lamborghinis. Yeah. Yeah. And as you put it out... We, look, that might solve the traffic problem, but it doesn't solve the transportation problem. And we've got a transportation problem here. We've got a com community health challenge of, 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 of a high degree. By the way, it's not the first time. And I'm not referring to the 1918 pandemic. I'm referring to when the West went to the far West <clears throat> and when the East came to the West. We've moved viruses and other bugs around uh, at a population level ever since the Egyptian times. It, this is not new. It, it, the difference is that whereas the number of troops and other movements in 1918 was, was the largest the world had ever seen, we're doing that on a weekly basis on United Airlines, you know. And, and, and that's the, it, it's not really a different condition. It's just a different frequency of interaction. And, and I also want to make sure we don't make the mistake of blaming people who live in jungles who, who, who eat green monkeys. This is not, you know, it's hardly for us to say that that's the source of the problem, which is such an easy uh, foil, when in fact, you know, smallpox was spread from the most civilized countries to the least civilized countries. So it was the other way around um, in, in the 15 and 16. Let me rephrase that and, and get into that in a little minute, because um, this is a really important point from Clive. You know, the, the um, our, our, what we saw at the beginning of COVID was not just uh, nationalism, but the out out racism, um, uh, accusations of these sort of medieval style behaviors, um, uh, the memes that went on the internet, I'm not even gonna repeat them. What, what's, we all eat wildlife. We come from, we're a species that eats wildlife. Uh, we still do it in the US, we eat lobster, we eat um, deer. Um, all around the world we do this. In, in the UK, it's, it's the rich that eat grouse and pheasant. It's, it's a very special dish, it's wildlife. Um, in Asia, in China, in, in many Southeast Asian countries, those, those meals have a very special cultural meaning that's deep-seated in the culture. But there are so many people now. And the, the wildlife trade is an industrial-scale production. Um, and the farms that were set up there were done in, in a way to supply that trade, to bring people out of poverty at the same time. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, there's a disease risk. Now, we do things every day. We're part of this problem, too. Um, we do things every day that drive this pandemic risk. You know, when you, when you go skiing, you see people with the beautiful fur trim coats. Those fur trims are often raccoon dogs farmed in China, Russia, that carry coronaviruses. You're driving pandemic risk. We go to the supermarket and buy products with palm oil that drives deforestation, that drives pandemic risk. We've connected the dots on that, and I think it empowers us to think beyond, oh, it's something over there that we don't need to worry about. It's something that we drive that we can deal with, we can reduce our impact, be more sustainable in the, in the daily lives we lead, and think about these scientific advances and get them out to the rest of the world and, and push our policymakers to do that so that we can solve these problems. Do you know, there was an experience I had just before the, uh, the shutdown in Cambodia, uh, beginning of 2020 and actually I came back and met you Peter do you remember um, but a group of AIDS activists came together to meet with Indian and Southeast Asian drug distributors to urge them in the strongest way possible not to shift their uh, supplies of HIV antiretroviral medications away from patients in need in uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, and, and Laos, um, because the pressure on selling them into China as cures for COVID-19 um, on the basis yeah. of no data, but just this sense that yeah. people had heard that if you take an HIV drug, it'll cure you from COVID. And what really struck me right then is as well as the, uh, the field-based research, the clinical development, the bringing these products to markets, we really have to be working with communities to understand how they um, contextualize the use of medicine. 
contextualize the use of uh, wildlife farms. And it's, a, it's an ongoing process where it's not us, all of us white men, going in and telling people what to do, but a, a, a real act of, uh, of humble listening. I think one of you mentioned the question of hubris earlier. But I really want us to end um, on an upbeat note. Um, so here we are, 2021. Um, we're saying we're entering the, AIDS of pan the age of pandemics. What are your hopes for this decade? And how do you see the work of EcoHealth Alliance supporting us in getting to that, that happy place? Um, and Clive, uh, as the rugby player, perhaps I could char uh, start with you. Well, I'm not sure it's relevant. Um, I think that we all enjoy the enormous privileges of, of globalization. We, 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 nothing that Peter was saying earlier about um, fur collars on, on, on ski jackets or uh, eating the foods we love. Um, and by the way, eating the foods other people love. Uh, you know, one of the great things about rugby was having a beer and a curry afterwards, and there's nothing better than Indian food after sports. So we enjoy, we, we are so privileged to have this global life that, that is available to many of us, not everybody, and probably increasingly will become. So, okay, so to enjoy that privilege, what responsibilities must we carry? And the one responsibility our leadership and the citizens must carry is to be global citizens. If you want to be a global uh, you know, a, 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 someone who enjoys the benefits of globalization, you need to contribute to the responsibilities of globalization, whether you're a leader, a scientist, or, or just Joe Schmo lining up for a vaccine at Yankee Stadium. Those are acts of civic responsibility which go beyond boundaries now. And I think Teddy Roosevelt, at the beginning of the, uh, beginning of the uh, 1900s, you know, gave a huge speech at, at, at the Sorbonne in which he, he described France as, and the uh, US at the time as the two great republics. They were the only real republics. All the rest were dictatorships and, uh, and uh, monarchies. Well, here we are where citizens, uh, as he put it, have to be responsible for their actions. We cannot rely only on the wisdom of a dozen leaders. Um, we also have to demand that those leaders are accountable you know, we need to vote, we need to wear masks, we need to do things that responsible citizens do in order to enjoy the benefits of globalization that bring bring hazards of the kind Peter is an expert in and Tillman knows how to solve. Peter, your thoughts? Well, to my mind, we're in the era of pandemics, but what I see is the beginning of the end of the era of pandemics. And this is the beginning of the end. Right now, what you're hearing today um, the, the solutions are being designed by the very best scientific minds. They're being pushed through to products by people who have a passion to get them out there. And the basic building blocks of those are being pulled out of the bat caves and the wildlife farms and, and the forests and the food chains around the world by our scientists. You know, we, we look at pandemics as an existential threat to our species. Uh, we, we've done the math on this. We, we, we know that every year there are more and more emerging disease events. We estimate over five new diseases get into people every year. So what do we do about it? Well, we've worked out where they emerge. We've worked out what species they are carried by right now. We've worked out which people on the planet are most at risk. We've even estimated the number of unknown viruses out there. But what's not happened yet is a concerted global effort to discover them all to get the sequences, the genetic codes into the hands of the scientists like Tillman's team to design the next generation of therapeutics to stop these things killing people. And there is no other existential threat to our species where we've been so lackadaisical. Mm. Think of terrorism. Before 9-11, we knew that there were some folks out there who wanted to blow things up. After 9-11, we didn't wait for that to happen. We listened to every single phone call coming into the U.S. The, the minute we heard rumors of a discussion, we disrupted that terrorist network. We need to get out there on the ground around the world and disrupt these pandemic chains of emergence. Design the strategies, the smart bombs that are going to defeat them when they emerge, because they will emerge. There will be another one. And if we're not careful, SARS-3, SARS-4 is going to emerge it's going to spread and we still won't have the solution. So I, I have 
great optimism. This is the beginning of the end of the pandemic era. We need to push, push, push to end it as rapidly as possible. And so that, in, you know, 50 years from now, people will look back and say, wow, those guys were really suffering with pandemics and COVID was a disaster, but they actually did something about it. Today, you're hearing what's being mm. done about it. So that brings us to Tillman to perhaps weave it all together from the R&D perspective. Your sense of uh, perspective, optimistic or otherwise, for the next 10 years? Well, um, let me first say it's just interesting to observe human behavior. We're very very bad at understanding risk and responding to risk. So, you know, Peter was just mentioning, uh, you know, 9-11. I mean, let's, let's put it into context of the number of people that died from terrorism over the past 10 years or 20 years. What people die in a week now and over the entire 10 year period from terrorism. So the threat that we are confronted with is magnitudes it, um, uh, larger. If the commitment in a there's no strategy, there's no real commitment. And so there's a complete disproportionality between the magnitude of the threat and our response to it. We're good at saying, these are the bad guys, let's drop some bombs on them, right? And that, that we can do and, and, and design weapon systems around that. When it comes to something like this, um, you know, look, I hope that conversations like this will lead thoughtful, intelligent people to realize that the technologies exist Peter has been doing what he's been doing for over a decade. We need to do more of that. And so if people realize that, hopefully they will fund that type of work and that will give us the foundation that if the next thing comes, hopefully we'll already anticipated it and already have molecules that when we see the first outbreak in wherever, we can immediately treat it and contain the problem as opposed to the situation that we're in now where there's still 800,000 people infected every day across the globe from SARS-CoV-2. So I think the pieces are there technically it is just a matter of getting the commitment. And how do you get the commitment? I think we can sit here all day long and ask for leadership. It's going to have to come from people that push that agenda, like Peter has, like Clive has, and others, and you, Ben. So I, there's, a, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but I think what is comforting is, to me at least, is that the technologies are there. I mean, let's not forget the time it took from the advent or the understanding that there's a new uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome to the time for the first treatment, almost a decade. Now, within a year, we had effective vaccines and effective therapies. So we're getting better at it. We just you need to, I think, really think about the future and think long term and make the investments that are required to put us in a better position the next time. May, may I, Ben, just uh, you may or may not need this, but look, the, the... When you look around at the institutions in the world that could lead this, it's unfair to ask WHO to lead it. They don't have the leadership um, um, strengths. It's inappropriate for ask any country, to ask any individual country to lead it. So in spite of Mr. Biden's uh, enthusiasm or President Xi's enthusiasm, you know, we can't have one country leading it. Uh, this is a G7 and uh, probably G20 problem. And if G7 or G20 or both don't get their act together around this, this year, the never again statement is going to sound awfully yeah. hollow. And there's a lot of politicians, there's a lot of politicians who are going to go down and they should, because now is the time for them to listen to the scientists like Peter and Tillman. Uh, look, all, all science uh, at first is wrong, but much of it is useful, as George Box said about models. But what we really need is, is, is global political leadership to get their act into gear now, this year. Because yeah. without it, this is going to be prolonged. Yeah. And, and my optimism is that they will. I think G7 is working on it. I think G20 is working on it. But they've got to get their act together. And I would add, uh, and as well as them getting their act together, they need to put the money into it. And, and you know, we have some yeah. mechanisms you know, if you're expecting this kind of, of of leadership from WHO, give them the money to do it. But nonetheless, you're absolutely right. We need that. We need that uh, passion and leadership from our from our political leaders. Well, thank you, Tillman, Clive, and Peter for joining us. Collaboration is key to our ability to rise up against the threat of new and emerging diseases. 
And the work that we've just heard spoken about is critical to getting this done and getting this done effectively. Thank you.